All right. Our next speaker will be talking about a not unrelated topic. Um, of course, we talk a lot about, we work a lot with hardware, software, and very often it's close propri propriety uh, software and hardware. Um, there's a lot of uh, people who are debating the fact that that might be kind of a bad idea because we should know how this technology works, we should know how the code works, and this should be something that's open, public, and transparent. Um, so a lot of people are uh, proposing to work more with open source software and even open source hardware. I know uh, recently a, uh, a laptop uh, got introduced that's completely open source uh, hardware. Um, our next speaker will be talking a little bit about that as well. But then in the case of sensors, sensors in the environment, sensors in the city, and uh, I'm just gonna take a little sneak peek if we're uh, close to uh, ready. <laughs> Sometimes it's a little bit chaotic here, but you do realize this is the creativity stage, and with some creativity, there's some chaos. You just can't, ex you can't escape that. Um, Almost, almost, okay. What if I count to like, if I count from 10, do you think you'll, done, you'll, you'll be done? <laughs> All right. I will, uh, I will continue to read what's on my little piece of paper. So the next speaker is uh, Frank Cousin. Frank will show how open source, source software, open source hardware, Digital maker practices and open design can be used by local communities to make sense of their environments. The fast raise of maker spaces, which used to be called hacker spaces, I think, but these days it's maker spaces, is creating new opportunities for citizen driven innovation in domains range, ra ranging from open hardware to digital fabrication, community informatics, and a particip a participatory sensing. In the past five years, the broad availability of open hardware Am I, is it, why am I speaking louder and louder? <laughs> um, uh, the broad availability of open hardware and the creation of online data sharing platforms have fostered the, fostered the design of low cost and open source sensors that citizens can appropriate to engage in, in environmental action. By collectively measuring and making sense of their environments, citizens can become aware of how their lifestyle affects the ecosystem and be inspired to adopt a more sustainable behavior. Please give a warm <laughs> welcome to Frank Kresin. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much to choosing this stage uh, as opposed to all the others that are as, uh, extremely interesting as well. Um, I'm the research director for an organization called Waag Society that is uh, based in Amsterdam, developing technology for social innovation. And I will talk about uh, the, sense, the Making Sense project that we're doing now, and I invite you in if you have any questions there. First of all, I'd like to talk about smartness. Um, many things are called smart all of the time. We have uh, smartphones, we have smart uh, thermostats, we have these smart fridges, and anybody knows what this is, by the way? It's yes, you know, it's a smart toilet. <laughs> you should have known. It's a toilet that analyzes whether or not you're pregnant or whether or not you have a certain disease and that could inform you if you want that or not. We have uh, smart assistants, of course, coming up, trying to help you in any sense of your living being. Well, this is, of course, the way as the people from uh, Korea are envisioning the future with those smart assistants. Somehow they have a very special aesthetics about that. But this is much more interesting, I'd say. It's a project in which um, people that are at the end of their life have a caressing machine that will help them pass out from this life to their next or no life, depending on what you think, uh, is uh, taking place in a very, like a friendly or fragile fashion. And of course we have Siri as well, for better or for worse. Uh, then we have smart buildings that are measuring the energy, the occupancy, the anything that can be measured and trying to optimize it. And finally we have much more important, I think, the smart city that is totally overhyped in many spaces, but it's trying to optimize the, the many flows that are in the city, the flows of people, of energy, of waste, of everything we have. Unfortunately, uh, this uh, scheme is a little bit broken because for once and all, it forgets the most important part of the smart city being, of course, the smart citizens. And opposed to all this smartness, we propose a way of empowerment, of appropriation, of trying to give people the tools themselves to make sense of that city and thereby make it truly smart. I've done some research into what smart citizens actually are, and we come about with these kind of uh, sentences like 
They will take responsibility for the place they live, work, and love. They value access over ownership. They'll ask forgiveness, not permission. So things like that. And I hope they're very familiar to at least some of you. But it somehow accomplishes, or it all sums up to this. It's about agency, responsibility, and empowerment. So how can people themselves take active agency and responsibility for the places that they live in and that they so love? I told you I'm from Waag Society. We are a media lab having 60 people developing technology for social innovation. We are at the intersection of art, science, and technology, where we explore emerging technologies and try to democratize those. We try to democratize and open up technologies that are open, fair, and inclusive. And we do so under the assumption that code is culture. And I think Matthijs, the previous speaker, has been very vocal and eloquent about why this is the case. So technology is more and more infusing the ways we live and also shaping the ways we live. Uh, just think about uh, the way that Tinder has uh, changed relationships or the start of those, the smart cars that are um, autonomously driving and making their choices. Of course, the machines that think about life and death that Matthijs talked about as well. And things like the OV chip guard that somehow uh, focus or shape the way we can use it and also navigate the city. So we as cultural beings, we as beings ourselves, should be in the driver's seat there. And the places to do so, we think, are in labs like this. In the fab labs, the maker spaces, the wet labs, the whatever labs. And I don't know who of you has been to the lab before like this. Anybody who has been to a lab like this before? Just a few. So I really invite you in. There are over 660 of those labs around the world. Many more coming up. Uh, there you just only not only find uh, technology, but you will find people themselves that are very willing to work with you and help you in whatever you try to do. These labs, they're far more than spaces. They're open spaces, places for uh, experiments and uh, like a laboratory. They're places for workshops. Uh, we do many performances there and exhibitions. But it much more, it focuses on not just the maker, but the critical maker. A maker who makes things, who makes software, hardware, whatever, makes it to understand the society at large and also influence it. So this is important and I urge you to go there. You can go there, for example, and we are working there uh, towards questions about the ecology. So the urban environmental challenges that we face, either in uh, air quality, in sound quality or sound pollution, in water and in uh, in air, uh, in sand or soil as well. And we try to address those with the help, help of open source technologies. And uh, we, there's an urgency to this because uh, more and more it becomes clear that our environment have a very, very uh, huge influence on our health. And even in a rather well, clean country like the Netherlands, people live on average 13 months shorter. So their lives are 13 months shortened by air pollution alone. It used to be two years, now it's 13 months, so it's better. But of course, it's much worse for people who have an inclination to be ill or have respiratory diseases or things like that. So this is an important issue. And although it's so important, uh, there are just a very few measuring stations, the official high quality, high expensive uh, measuring stations that are measuring the air quality. Acti actually, we have about 110 in the Netherlands alone. And if you see the points on the map, and if you know the Netherlands a little bit, then you see a kind of a, a bias <laughs> towards uh, Rotterdam and Amsterdam. And actually, the, the rest of the, uh, the country is rather not well represented at all. Uh, this, by the way, is the reason, uh, because we do it like this, on average, everything's fine. So it means that on average, our levels are below the European levels. And it means and it meant that we could start driving under 30, which nobody asked for. It's not good for the environment. Uh, but um, rule-based, rule-wise, you can do it. So this is why we are trying to help people, trying to see how they can do additional measurements to really see what's going on. And we need to do so because from street to street, from square to square, from house to house, uh, these levels are differing. So if we want to have really know what's going on, we need a lot, lot, lot more sensors. And people could, well, could be the ones to do that. We were inspired by Safecast. Does anybody of you know Safecast? I think it's a very interesting project. It, it, this was started in Fukushima, so after the uh, tsunami uh, a few years ago in Japan, they experienced high levels of radiation. They were very high, but people really didn't know how high they were and also how bad it was. And the official measurements were just a few. So people started making their own measurements. They made these open source devices as groups, uh, tried to work with them, and you see quite accurate maps that show you where radiation is high and where radiation is low. Also, it inspired a huge community of people who are doing this around the world. 
Does anybody here know the ice packs, by the way? The ice packs is a way of measuring uh, fine particles, so fine dust particles, by your normal phone, by just putting a small refractor on the camera. So this refractor will help you to refract the light, and based on what you see when you look at the sky on a clear day, you know how much of those fine particles are there. And what we learn from it is having very low cost and, and not so accurate sensors, but if you have enough of them, you can get a really uh, accurate picture that represents the current state much uh, very well. Then, of course, you can use uh, something totally different, like plants. Uh, people in Belgium started to use strawberry plants, aardbeienplanten, uh, for measuring air quality, and they did a measurement, well, like a campaign, where they invited people in having those strawberry plants. There were a lot of those, and the based on those, you could really see how the pollution differed across the city. And based on this, uh, the uh, political parties started having discussions about it. And then finally, uh, this is also interesting, it's in London, where people started to use small sensors and put them on the backs of pigeons. And with the pigeons, they flew around and they made kind of accurate or not so accurate maps of air pollution as well. Uh, we were very inspired by those and we started to work with these people who are from the Fab Lab Barcelona. And they made a kit like this. Oops, oh, wait. Hmm. This. <laughs> it's a smart citizen kit. It's a small piece of hardware uh, that allow you to measure things on the climate. And uh, I have two of those here, so you could just pass them around. They used a Kickstarter campaign, and from those Kickstarter, they came up with this much more improved version. It's measuring certain aspects about the climate. They had uh, the hardware, the software, the platform that you can see where, is, uh, uh, where the sensors are. And worldwide, they had the kind of the success measuring things like temperature, humidity, light, noise, uh, CO, I don't know, and uh, stickstoff, NOx. Um, but they were very hardware focused. So they took the people that uh, were interested in measuring, but they didn't cater so much to people that were interested in the environment at all. So we started out in Amsterdam. Uh, we bought a hundred of those kits. Together with the city of Amsterdam, we gave them to people that were actually interested in the climate. And we asked them, why are you here? Well, mainly for three reasons. Some were interested in participation, some were interested in technology, and most of them were interested in their local climates because of the reasons that I just gave. So before long, we had about 70 of those uh, stations online. Um, the, the local government started to become very interested because they wanted to know what's going on in their city as well because they didn't know that well. And uh, we were actually quite proud to have so many of those sensors online, but just for a short time because it was kind of hard to get them online. It was like an alpha version of a thing, but it, it took even more uh, effort to keep them online. So we tried to help people and support. And finally, we came up with some visualizations that showed uh, very much the sounds uh, as they were different in the city throughout the night and the day throughout the week. So somehow we had the feeling that we were onto something. People kept coming back. We uh, interested also, well, we invited also a lot of uh, official organizations to understand what's going on and talk with our participants and talk amongst each other to understand what, well, how people could help there. And this is what we found. There were a few lessons learned. First of all, the climate and, and uh, air pollution especially is a very complex, complicated uh, thing. So you cannot go into that domain and then immediately know what to do. So you really have to understand quite well what is so how this air quality is, what it exactly is, and how it relates to health before you can say anything, of course. Then the second is from, from knowledge to actually action is quite difficult. So now, okay, now you know that your city is polluted or your street is polluted, what do you do? So you have to have a plan there, start campaigning, invite other people in. However, and the sensors, the, the sensors were okay. They were kind of cheap, they were open source, so they had all the good things, but they were not so accurate. So it was hard to really conclude anything else than sound quality. So this is important too, but finally, uh, people didn't seem to matter that much. They were more interested in their empowerment, it's the feeling of empowerment and feeling of agency, than in accuracy. accuracy. So that's why we thought, well, we will open up, open up the space. We will not only use this technology, but technology in general, open source technologies that help you understand your environment. We teamed up with, uh, I don't know, about uh, 20 organizations that were interested as well, from universities to fab labs to international players. They all wanted to start and, and understand this. 
and we, we thought to generalize it. So try to empower people to use any kind of software and hardware to understand their environment and take appropriate action. Because, as I told you, it's kind of needed. The, 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 um, the quality of the data are not there, and it's a win-win situation. So the people will win, uh, but also the climate will win, and the city itself win as well. And we'll hope this will, well, we are, are now kind of certain it will result in more agency, uh, in better informed citizens, in more engaged citizens as well. More data means more insight, means eventually, hopefully, better policies, and this will amount to a better, well, more livable city. We used kind of different methodologies. So uh, not only the smart citizen kit, but things like this. Kite mapping, did anybody try kite mapping already? It's really, really neat. You can do it in the city as well. You take a kite, like a flying kite, you put a camera under it, and, and depending on what kind of camera it is, you can see things like, uh, for example, the foliage in, in forests, if it's well or not, or if uh, well, you can make your highly accurate maps of the city. We did emotional sensing, for example, where people said not only how much sound there is, but also how it affected their, their well-being, their sense of well-being. We did spectrography, we, did, we tried to make this, this is actually the nicest thing, but we didn't work, it didn't work yet. It's like a small snake that has open source uh, uh, like sensing equipment, and it will sense the, quali the water quality of the canals in Amsterdam. I don't know if you've been to Amsterdam, but we have a lot of canals there. It would be nice to have it swimming around and then collecting its data. And we made things like this. Our, our own open source sensors, they had a kind of a problem because they look a little bit like a bomb. Uh, they have this feeling. So that's why we put our logo very far and also talked about people that's not a bomb actually, but it's something to sense your environment. We have a methodology. So based on all these experiments, we came up with how do you do this in general? Um, it comes from, from meeting people, uh, having them to meet, matching them based on shared interests, mapping out the issues, making your sensors, measuring the environment, mastering the data, so understanding what's actually, what it actually means, and mobilizing people then. And we have uh, put this in small booklets that are all open source, you can download them. We try for people for this to be like agnostic, so you can choose yourself what topic you're interested in, and you can use the same methodology anyway. Well, from there, we started to going not so much global, but European. So we teamed up with uh, these people from Barcelona, Pristina, England, uh, and Belgium uh, to come up with uh, like a unified open source toolkit for citizen sensing. It's bottom-up citizen sensing, as we call it. So it means that normal citizen sensing is something like where, where um, scientists ask people to join in on their projects. What we want to do is different. We want to invite people to come up with their problems and then invite the experts to help the people to solve their problems. So that's what we're trying to do. Uh, it first, in the first case, we look at the, the streets with the highest emissions in Amsterdam being the Valkenburgerstraat and the Wieboudstraat. Uh, Milieudefensie, uh, uh, like an, an activist group, did some measurements on where the most uh, polluted streets are. Those are, they are those. <laughs> and based on that, we are now, uh, we now invited those people in. So this is what it looks like. We help them to come up with where the, the hotspots are, where their interests are. We help them make like maps where sensors should be, and then we collectively make the sensors again, open source sensors. These are the sensors as they are uh, put to uh, like uh, calibration for calibration in the Vondel Park. We make them ourselves, and then we try people. Well, we, we will see what comes out, and everybody seems to be very interested. We ourselves too, because what we want to do is take that new data and then also go out to the government and see if they can change their regulations based on the outcomes. So what to do if you want to have your own projects like this? This is dedicated to people who do these uh, projects. So um, first of all, if you want to do a project, how open are you really? So are you open just uh, on the, the strategy, or on the tools, on the sensors, on the acquisition, on the interpretation, on the problem definition? You have to think very hard how open you want to be. And we from Vast Society say, of course, the more open is the better, but everybody should take their own stance, of course. We encourage learning by making very much. So we don't think you can do this right in the first instance. You have to do it, learn from it, do it, learn from it, do it, learn from it again, and try to open and also be open to your failures and to sharing your failures, of course. We, we use and promote open technologies. Open technologies are the only ones that people can use to build upon very easily. So this is the way that we collectively well, build a knowledge base for others to share, and uh, open source technologies are key. 
By that, we enable collective engagement, so we want people to join in, of course, and we try to empower smart citizens, as we call them. Of course, smart citizens is like, it's like a, a how do you say, tongue-in-cheek name. So it's, a, it's a name to, to be like an opposition to the smart city, but what we mean is people that appropriate use and appropriate technologies to make the cities into more livable, more healthy, and better places. I'll skip this. This is maybe more important. <laughs> Please, if you remember one thing, it should be this. It's the logo and the, like the motto for the maker movement. If you cannot open your technology, you really don't own it. So we should demand and ask for open technologies more and more. Fortunately, many players are doing this, like even Tesla has opened up its, uh, its patents. Uh, and I hope many, many people will join. If you want to read more, you should take one picture. And if not, this is, my, this is the end of the slide. Thank you very much. Any questions, remarks? Here you are. I have a question. <laughs> How easy is it to get people uh, on board to cooperate with your, uh, your um, project? Yeah, that's a good question. It's, it's uh, very easy to get people to do so because um, many people who live in those cities, they are active, they want to be active agents and want to be involved in its future. So if you send them the right message and the message is not join us, but a but message like, help us to empower you, then they will come in. So it's always very easy to have many people coming in. Yeah, ha and say people in the audience, they want to join, how can they best uh, do that? Yeah, the best thing is first to download the publication that I just showed. It's a Smart Citizen publication. So if you look for a Smart Citizen publication WAG, then you'll find it. Any of our findings from last year are in there. We have a follow-up project called Making Sense. Uh, and you're also, yeah, you can talk to me afterwards and I'll tell you how to join. Perfect. Are there any other questions? That's it. You guys look a little bit sleepy. Am I right? Are you guys a little bit sleepy? You should <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, thank you so much, uh, Frank, uh, for your uh, for your inspiring talk and I, I hope uh, I hope it takes off this project this is really yeah, great yeah it does so if you want to know more please let me know thank you all right you can uh, yeah give him a little warm hand <laughs> uh, you can give that to uh, backstage